Good afternoon. Can you all hear me in the back? Great. Um, it is such an honor to be in this beautiful space. Thank you to everyone at the Oxford Union for inviting me to address all of you and to take your questions. I'm here as Editor-in-Chief of Vanity Fair, but in spirit I am here as a devoted student of English literature. I had intended to be a professor in that field, so I hope you will indulge me a little foray into a favorite 19th century novel. I promise it relates to the state of journalism and the media today, and I will talk a bit about that, and then you will ask me all sorts of excellent questions later in the hour. The novel is New Grub Street by George Gissing, who, as you probably know, was a sort of second-tier Victorian writer. He published more than two dozen novels, but New Grub Street, which came out in 1891, is widely recognized as his best, and it was rather chic when I was in graduate school. Um, if, an, if a novel can be considered chic, I would say yes. Uh, but I don't know if it's still chic, so I'll tell you a bit about it by way of introduction. It's about the literary world at the end of the 19th century, and it lays out very clearly the tense relationship between art and commerce as it relates to writing, both fiction and nonfiction. Its characters include the editor of a prestigious literary journal, his research assistant, who is also his daughter, a worldly and somewhat aggressive journalist and critic called Jasper Milvane, Jasper's sisters, who are making their living as teachers, but who, on his advice, begin to dabble in what we would now call young adult fiction, a literary novelist who had one commercial hit, but is having a little trouble with his muse, the novelist's wife, whose social ambitions far exceed his own, another novelist who can best be described as avant-garde, whose mission it is to write a novel that is so hyper-real that no one will read it, and a very entrepreneurial young man called Welpdale, who circles around all these figures, and by the end of the novel becomes a sort of proto-version of a literary agent or a publisher. So you can already see the ways in which New Grub Street might be considered prescient just by virtue of its characters and their inclinations. Together, they make up this very specific literary and letters ecosystem. But I want to read to you from a passage toward the end, when the two most ambitious young men, Jasper and Welpdale, are discussing Welpdale's plans to revitalize a stale periodical called Chet. I'm going to jump around a little bit, but this is the gist of it. Welpdale says, I want to find a capitalist who will get possession of that paper Chet and transform it according to an idea I have in my head. The thing is doing very indifferently, but I am convinced it might be made a splendid property with a few changes in the way of conducting it. The paper is rubbish, Jasper says, and the kind of rubbish, oddly enough, which doesn't attract people. Then Welpdale says, precisely, but the rubbish is capable of being made a very valuable article. Now just listen to my notion. In the first place, I should slightly alter the name. Only slightly, but that little alteration would in itself have an enormous effect. Instead of chat, I should call it chit-chat. I believe it is a stroke of genius. Chat doesn't attract anyone, but chit-chat would sell like hotcakes, as they say in America. Jasper thinks this is a great idea. And Welpdale goes on, what I next propose is this. No article in the paper is to measure more than two inches in length, and every inch must be broken into at least two paragraphs. And once he has established that constraint, he turns to the question of his audience. Let me explain my principle. I would have the paper address itself to the quarter educated, that is to say, the great new generation that is being turned out by the board schools, the young men and women who can just read but are incapable of sustained attention. People of this kind want something to occupy them in trains and on buses and trams. As a rule, they care for no newspapers except the Sunday ones. What they want is the lightest and frothiest of chit-chatty information, bits of stories, bits of description, bits of scandal, bits of jokes, bits of statistics, bits of foolery. Am I not right? Everything must be very short, two inches at the utmost, and their attention can't sustain itself beyond two inches. Even chat is too solid for them. They want chit-chat. Now, for anyone like me who has come of age in journalism in the last 20 years, this sounds like the internet, um, circa 2019. Um, it sounds like it could have been said last week. Consider the parallels. There is the claim that no one has any more attention span. We have heard this since the founding of MTV. 
There is the notion that technology, in this case, new modes of transportation, especially the train, which had completely changed the landscape of England and also changed the very concept of mobility, including social mobility, that new technology requires a new kind of content. And there is the acknowledgement of varying degrees of education, which is particularly salient at the end of the 19th century, when there had been a massive boom in literacy among the middle and lower classes that created a lot of anxiety in the upper classes about how those people who had not been raised with culture and privilege and had not gone to Oxford and such places would know what they should read and who was going to tell them. There was huge anxiety about this. And finally, there is the emphasis on commercial viability. Everything needs to sell, and so it needs to find and cater to its audience. Now, this is a rather cynical way of looking at journalism, and I raise it in part to marvel at it, because it feels so relevant to our current era, but also to diverge from it, or at least to talk about the ways in which we owe it to ourselves to disregard certain of these tenets. I should say in passing uh, that New Grub Street is an incredibly cynical novel overall. Um, it's totally Darwinian in terms of who gets married uh, and who survives, um, which is exactly what makes it fun to read, although possibly less fun to live in. Um, but I want to tell you a story or two from my career that speaks to this kind of thinking. And I'll end by saying a little bit about Vanity Fair. Um, and I mean Vanity Fair the magazine, not the novel by Thackeray. I have worked as an editor for about 20 years now at a variety of publications, including two literary quarterlies, a contemporary art monthly, a news weekly, a daily, and now a monthly again with a daily website. And in each place, we have grappled with the role of technology in what we produce and the nature of our audience. And about 10 years ago, when the internet was really taking off as a delivery system for content, it became a truism in my industry that no one was going to read long articles anymore. Tell me if this sounds familiar. Long articles were becoming extinct, and it was because everybody was very busy and needed things they could read on their desktops at lunchtime. Mobile was not really a thing yet. And so we were meant to absorb the idea that everything that we commissioned as editors, with very few exceptions, should top out at about 800 words. I never really believed that as a reader. I didn't want to believe it, but there it was. But you know, right around then, these little waves of support Little waves of support began amassing for what people started calling long form, which wasn't really a thing before. It wasn't a term that anybody used. At least I don't remember the term existing, but it meant magazine length journalism, the sort of stylistic narrative of several thousand words or more that had its heyday in the new journalism of the 1960s and 70s in magazines like Esquire, and which is still the engine of The New Yorker and also a Vanity Fair. And so this thing called long form suddenly became a privileged category again in reaction to the shortening of everything. And it has gained renewed prestige. The idea now is that in the age of the internet, long form is almost a luxury, precisely because you don't have the time for it. You have to make the time for it, but it reflects a commitment and an investment from a publication to tell a big story in depth with reporting, with travel, with attention to prose style and narrative arc, often with photographs or a very elaborate digital presentation. The cheaper all that other chit chat content became, the more value long form took on. And today, I don't think people are all that surprised to see that long form and original reporting, at least in the ecosystem in which I work, are what tend to drive reader and, lo and subscriber loyalty. And most importantly, they drive reader engagement, which is one of our great watchwords in the business at the moment. Because readers know that we have invested in it, and because by virtue of its voice and its reporting, it is unique. And don't get me wrong, it doesn't mean that short pieces don't have value too. They absolutely do. When you work at a news weekly, you know that you can pack a ton of information into a caption, let alone 200 words or 500 words, and you serve your audience meaningfully in that way. The point is that long and short could coexist. They were not mutually exclusive. And the death of the long reported story was greatly exaggerated. So that's one thing. The other thing is the question of catering to your audience, giving your audience what you think they want. This can get very patronizing very quickly, and it is complicated, but I want you to consider where we are with the technology. We live in an era of recommendation engines, 
which is to say you buy a book on Amazon and they say, oh, people who like this book like this other book too. Why don't you buy this other book? Or Netflix lines up a bunch of cooking shows because you've watched every season of the British Bake Off. Or the Facebook algorithm puts kittens at the top of your Instagram feed every morning. Now, in many ways, this is an amazing service, and I like kittens as much as the next person. But it can also get you into a bubble of likeness and sameness, because even as it imitates serendipity and word of mouth, oh, you like that, try this. It doesn't account for an individual having a wide range of tastes or inherent curiosity. It doesn't account for the idea that what you might want is something completely different from what you just had or what you might want is to be surprised, or that many of the things that we read or watch or listen to are things that we never expected to like, but somebody who mattered to us introduced them to us and they changed our lives. That does happen. I am an optimist, but I feel like it happens. And driven in part by social media, news organizations are also adopting personalization as a way to serve their audience what they want based on what they've wanted before. You can see the appeal, but you can also see that taken to its logical conclusion, that system can result in a reading public that is more narrowly informed by the day. Now, I am a, in a lucky position in regard to this because the magazine where I work, Vanity Fair, our whole value proposition is that we cover a wide range of subjects. We are known for in-depth celebrity profiles and for stories of scandal and for financial investigations, and we broke the news about who Deep Throat was in Woodward and Bernstein's reporting of Watergate, and also we do fashion portfolios and true crime, and we report on your royal family. And so part of our mission is to take readers in directions that they might not have anticipated, and the best thing that I hear from readers is that they read something that surprised them. So it's very clear to me that while my job is to serve readers, it is also to surprise them, and as with long form and short form writing, we work to find that balance. Because to abdicate completely to an algorithm the decisions about what the news is, or what the important stories are, or who is worthy of coverage, would be to deny that journalists and editors do have creative expertise and human experience that inform our decisions. The truth is that humans can do certain things much better than an algorithm can. One of the things we do better is taking risks, which I firmly believe is part of my role and any editor's role. By that I mean taking risks on commissioning a story or choosing a cover subject who might not fit the mold of the past, but who we think signals something about the future. Which also means taking a risk on our readers, that they will come along with us and be open to new voices and new faces and new angles. Because if we don't take those risks, we are only following the culture, not leading it. We are collapsing our sphere of influence instead of expanding it. And I don't think that is a sustainable model for the future. On that note, I've been editor of Vanity Fair now for just shy of a year and a half. And later this week, we are doing something very exciting. We're launching our complete archive online. The magazine was founded in 1913, and it ran through the 30s. Um, and then the Depression depressed it, and it closed its doors. But it was revived in the 80s. So there is a considerable history to dive into and stunning photography and top-notch reporting, and I invite you all to take a look. As you browse through it, you'll notice how the magazine evolves in its design, in its aesthetic, in the types of people it featured on the cover, in the types of people who contributed to it. It is always recognizably Vanity Fair. It is always at its core about personality and influence and power and aspiration, but those are not static qualities. The nature of power changes with the times. The nature of aspiration changes with the times, and therefore so does the magazine. And it's not just Vanity Fair. We who work in the media now are all agents of change. That's maybe where I find the most sympathy with the characters of New Grub Street. I may not agree with all of their choices, but I do agree that when the world is undergoing such major transformation, standing still is not an option. And like them, I do obviously also want something entertaining to read in the train or on the plane or however we will travel in the future. Thank you so much. Um, and now please ask me anything. Thank you so much for your talk. I wanted to begin by asking about your work at Vanity Fair. 
you've described part of your mission as taking the pulse of today's culture. How do you go about fulfilling this mission and what are the most significant obstacles you face, especially in a digital era, in doing so? Oh, um, it's a big question. I, I should say that I consider the culture in its broadest sense, which is to say not just arts and entertainment, but also our political culture, um, the culture of technology and all the ways that it affects us. So basically it's an excuse for us to cover everything. Um, in, I hope, a discerning way with always, as I said, an emphasis on personality and power um, and aspiration. So we, um, you know, there's a lot of freedom in that because really any story can be a Vanity Fair story. And I think that we live in a especially fertile age for our stories. Um, there is a good amount of um, misuse of power these days. There is a good amount of, uh, scandal and corruption and um, while it can make for difficulty living it can also make for tremendous narratives um, and it and it makes for a, a need it sort of creates a need for investigation and clarity and so if anything we have too many stories and our work is mostly um, figuring out how to whittle them down but um, but I think we approach it really like like anyone would which is that we come to work every day and ask well what is what is making us curious in the culture? What is confusing us? What do we think we can bring insight and expertise to? Um, where do we think that we can tell a story in a particular way that would be unique to us? And um, we take it from there. So you said that you have too many stories. How do you whittle them down, like you said? How do you decide which ones to go Well, with? in that regard, um, the internet is really a wonderful thing because while we are bound by um, a finite number of pages in print, um, we have boundless space online, which doesn't mean that you want to flood it. Um, but we are able to be much more nimble and flexible than, than in the past in terms of if we have a timely story um, or a story that we think could really start a conversation, um, we don't have to wait for our print cycle anymore. So if, if anything, you know, we have sort of a rough sense of how many stories we can have in the pipeline before things start to feel crowded. But I encourage all of my editors to think first about timeliness um, and less about platforms, um, which is to say if we have a story that we think matters right now, we have the means to publish it right now. And that is a great gift that editors um, didn't always have. You've also been described as changing the tone of Vanity Fair and setting a different culture. What would you say the new tone is and was it difficult to create such a change in just a year? Um, I'm not sure that... Uh, let me think about how I would describe the tone. It, it's... Um, to the question of difficulty, you know, in my case, and in many cases, when an editor um, takes on a new project, there, there is a generational change. And I think that that had a lot to do with um, the changes that people perceive on the outside. Mm -hmm. My frame of reference is different um, than a person a generation above me, as it would, uh, as it would of course, be. Um, my interests are different. My background is different. And, and, and these jobs are always, to a certain extent, sensibility jobs, which is to say the editor in chief has a role to play in terms of determining um, what we cover. You know, you work within the parameters of, of what the title's core competencies have always been, which I described a little bit, kind of what Vanity Fair has always done. But um, I felt it incumbent on me to bring my perspective to those stories. So one maybe very simple thing um, that I felt strongly about was that the, um, you know, the, our culture, the world that we live in, is much more diverse than it used to be. It's in many ways more open and more transparent than it used to be. And it felt to me that um, that, that was a value that I wanted to bring to my work at Vanity Fair. And what direction do you hope to take the magazine in the future years? Well, um, it's not. It's, um, it sort of goes back to what I was saying about timeliness. Um, it seems to me that since, since we have the capacity to be timely and to break news 
in ways that used to be very harder used to be very hard for a monthly magazine to do simply because of the production schedule. When you're an editor, you think a lot about the production schedule. It's quite boring, but you have to think about it. Um, but it was very restrictive in the past, and I think that I want us to be leading cultural conversations, um, which is to say publishing pieces that start conversations about who has influence or, um, or who is wielding their influence in a particular way, and also to break news, um, which the magazine has, al has always done, but, but was maybe hard to do in a, in a more sustained way. So moving in a slightly different direction, um, I wanted to talk about the women in the space of journalism today. What do you feel are the biggest challenges women face in sort of entering the industry? Um, and what steps could we take to make it a more diverse space? Um, I think, let me sp speak a little bit to my experience. There have definitely been, I have been very privileged in my career to have many mentors and supporters um, and not to have endured some of the kinds of harassment that many of my peers have. Um, even so, there have definitely been moments where I have been the only woman in the room or the, or the only person championing a particular idea and I have felt the lack of allies. And while storytelling hardly breaks down along simple lines like gender or race, um, and interests don't break down along those lines either, it is definitely true that, that being outnumbered in certain ways can make you feel a little powerless. And so I have always been very grateful to the people who helped me to feel powerful and I think that the way to improve the situation is not only to have more women and more people of color and more people from different backgrounds, um, you know, whether that has to do with class or geography or whatever it is, um, to have more people in those roles, um, it, it simply makes it more likely that the, the people who come after them will have more opportunities to feel empowered. Um, I think that that's part of our responsibility when we become leaders in the field. And is there, are there any th concrete steps that you think could be taken in order to make the space more inclusive? I mean, certainly when it comes to hiring, we think about it in a number of ways. And the ones that come immediately to mind have to do with hiring, which is to say to make sure that we are always prioritizing a newsroom and a staff that is diverse in, all, in many ways. Um, and also in commissioning and assigning stories, photography, at every moment, um, in the process, there is an opportunity to give someone a chance who might not, you know, were, were it not me in charge, but someone else, maybe that person wouldn't be given a chance. So I like to take a pretty open view and I do like to take risks. And what that means is that, you know, we have assigned stories and photos to people who haven't worked for Vanity Fair before, which sounds obvious, but the truth is that often publications can get into cycles and and I'm sure many of you know the catch-22 that if sometimes if you don't have experience you can't get the job but the job is precisely what you need to get you the experience so I, having benefited from that myself um, I, I we try to keep the door open um, to give those kinds of experiences to other people so sort of leading on from that, you've spoken out in the past on the struggle of how to be yourself in a world that prefers conformity. Um, have you seen a change in this culture over the past decade? And do you feel like there's anything more we can do to overcome this mentality? I definitely think it's changing for the good. Um, I think that part of it is just that um, there are so many more places now where people can express who they are, and as complicated as some of those places and platforms might be, and I'm thinking of social media, you know, chiefly, um, I do think it's easier f for people to connect or to find someone who might be a role model um, or to find someone who's doing something interesting. I mean, when I was growing up, I didn't even know that editor was a job, um, which is, you know, which is fine. It didn't, um, didn't prevent me from having a perfectly happy childhood. and. Um, college education, but it's more just that that things were narrower, your, your experience was narrower, your access to information was more limited. 
And now it just seems to me like those circles have widened. And I look around and I see, um, you know, it's not only that I see people in roles who I never expected to see in those roles. It's like, you know, there are new ways of creating content, new ways of being involved in politics, new ways of being involved in fundraising or advocacy that I think just widen the possibility that you know, you don't have to do what your neighbors do or what your small community does. You can reach out. So on, on that note of deciding what to do, um, you also taught classes in creative writing and literature. Um, what made you decide to go down the route of being the editor-in-chief of Vanity Fair instead of academia? And I think we were talking a bit about this upstairs. Yes, we did. Um, I And I should say that I, I never... Um, I never really had a master plan for my career, so the, the, I hope this isn't the end of it, but um, it's, a, it's a marvelous place to be, and I feel, again, so grateful and lucky to, to be in this role. Um, and every place where I worked as an editor, I mostly did it because I would t take those jobs because there was something at that particular, particular publication that appealed to me, or there was something about the editor-in-chief or whoever I was working for at the time where I felt I could learn from them and and to have all of that lead to Vanity Fair has been a dream, obviously. Um, but yes, I went to graduate school fully uh, intending to be a professor, and um, but I did have some good advice early on, actually, from a wonderful professor of mine. He said he was one of the few people in my department who encouraged us to write for a general audience, which is to say that he encouraged us to pitch book reviews um, to places that reviewed books and essays and other things outside the realm of purely academic publications um, because he felt that it was important for us to have those dialogues with the general reading public. And I think he was right. At, the, at least he was right for me um, it, it, because I began to develop a voice that um, that was more broadly involved in, in the contemporary culture of the moment. Now, it helps that I was at least nominally studying late 20th century literature, and it was the late 20th century. So I was already current. I, I was not a medievalist, and that bridge is maybe a little harder to, um, to cross. But I just, I, th I, thought it, I thought it was good advice that even if you were going to go on to an academic career, that shouldn't necessarily mean that you were at a remove from the real world. And so maybe that's part of the reason that I was more comfortable um, or that it made sense for me to eventually end up outside academia. Um, but uh, as I mentioned upstairs, I recently ran into one of my dissertation advisors. Um, and I'm hoping to go and visit her class this fall um, and give her class basically the same advice that I was, was given. Do you think you're ever going to go back to academia, or do you have to continue in the industry that you're in? I would love to teach. I would. Um, I would. It's a. It's. You know, it's it's a difficult. Um, it's not not unlike journalism, but it's a difficult market to break into. Um, I you know I now have a completely different skill set, um, but I will say that although I didn't teach for very long, I did teach as part of my graduate program. And a lot of what I have to do in my current job, I really trace to those days because teaching is in a certain way performing. It is getting up in front of a room and trying to lead people through some expertise. And it is obviously communicating and it is working with writing, at least the kind of teaching that I was doing. Um, and it has to do also with um, you know, trying to make a connection between the work that is immediately at hand and some bigger ideas about what might make it relevant. And all of that is, I think, in line with what we do in publishing and journalism. So in a funny way, I don't see them as that distinct from each other, but the pure fun of being in a classroom and also of reading novels with people who want to read those novels or even don't want to read them, but will be better for them if they have, which I firmly believe, um, that is fun. And I would love to do that again. So just following on from that, 
um, where do you see yourself headed in the next few years or like the next decade? Do you, do you think you're going to continue to work at Vanity Fair? I don't know. I don't know. I'm thinking ahead to our fall issues and that's about as far as I can get. Um, so, but I, I do think um, I mean, we are, we're, we're having a lot of fun and I hope we're doing good work. So, and that suffices for now. Okay. Um, before moving on to audience questions, I wanted to ask about your work at Time Magazine mm -hmm. uh, because you oversaw its listing of the 100 most influential people in the year and the person of the year. How did you go about this process and what impact do you feel that these lists and choices have on a global scale? So this is something I actually feel sort of passionate about because lists get a bad rap, I think. They're, they can seem very gimmicky. Um, the Time 100 was, we called it the 100 most influential people in the world. Um, and there, but of course, you know, a lot of publications do lists and mm -hmm. we have one at Vanity Fair actually that's only about six years old called The New Establishment, which has to do with kind of the people who, um, uh, I hesitate to say control the strings, but my hands are going there anyway. <laughs> um, you know, in, in media and business and politics and all of those things. So, but I think, you know, with the exception of a few lists that have very severe and specific metrics, like your net worth or what have you, the things that I've worked on have always been a little bit more nebulous. Um, and I have always felt that they are a great platform to, um, to, bring, to bring attention to work that, that is very valuable or influential that maybe otherwise would go unnoticed. And the way that you do it with a list is that you have, if you're thinking about influential people or a new establishment, you know, there are people who sort of are obviously on those kinds of lists and they're world leaders and they're, you know, um, investment bankers or in the world of entertainment, they're studio heads or um, actors or what have you. But uh, if, you, if you could have used those people in part to help bring attention to the other part of the list, which is people who are kind of up and coming, they're rising talent or they're working on some very local advocacy initiative that you think could have wider implications or something like that, then your list starts to be sort of a living thing. Like, it, like all of those things together create a picture of a world that is a little more integrated. And that's what I always enjoyed about it and still enjoy about it um, is to surprise people um, in terms of who might show up on a list like that. And the other thing that I think lists do is that in retrospect, they can give you a very clear sense of what the major stories are of our time. So if you think about a list that you would make of the new establishment or powerful people 15 or 20 years ago, you wouldn't have, I mean, the, most of the technology companies through which we live our lives daily now didn't exist. Maybe 15 years ago, Steve Jobs would have been on that list. Um, not yet Mark Zuckerberg, not Jack Dorsey, not Jeff Bezos, you know, when you start to see these these waves come in of not only new people but like new types of work and new just whole new worlds of existence almost it tells you something about where our attention is and where the world is going and i think that there's something concentrated about a list because as humans we need to categorize we need at a certain point to to whittle things down. There's something concentrated about the narrative of a list that I think is helpful in that way. Thank you. And that is everything I have to say about lists. <laughs> <laughs> and we can move on to audience questions now. So if we raise your hand, if you have a question, can we go to the member in the back? Hello, thank you so much for your uh, talk. Um, my question is, where do we go from here in the US what is the role of media in clarifying a vision of hope? And how can we as writers, professors, and publishers work together to create a more peaceful world? That is a lot to solve. Um, I, it's, it's funny, this question of hope, I wrestle with the notion of whether that's a responsibility of the media beyond the presentation of truth and accuracy. And I wouldn't say no exactly, but I do think it varies publication to publication. Um, I think you sort of have to figure out what is your zone, um, what is your relationship with your readers, 
what is your capacity for storytelling that, that, can, that can do that kind of inspirational work? And it's a funny thing that I've thought a lot about, even just taking the reins at Vanity Fair, because um, there are certain subjects in which we all need to be well informed. You know, I think of climate change, for example. Now, a lot of people talk about climate change coverage, and now I'm not talking even about Vanity Fair, I'm just talking about the sort of general, what I see and hear and pick up from my peers in the industry. I have heard people say that the problem with the way that climate change is covered is that it is, in fact, too negative. Um, well, it's negative for a reason, <laughs> right? But, but the idea is that, well, if we could find ways to shed light on those issues in a, in a, in a manner that is more hopeful or that shows more of a path for optimism or even for action, then those stories would resonate more and the people who need to pay attention to them might pay more attention to them. I don't, know, I don't know, again, like depends on your outlet, you know, whether that's your job. There are people who are out there, you know, sort of using hope as an editorial mission and those publications are important um, and the work is important. But I, I, think, I, think it, I think it gets complicated in that sense if you think about the media as a monolith. I think you really just have to, to go, and as a, as a reader also, you have to think about, well, what do I expect from this publication? Do I expect Vanity Fair to inform me about you know, the melting ice caps, or, do, or am I gonna get that from The Economist, or am I gonna get that from somewhere else? And as editors, we sort of can build and it, those relationships with our readers and maybe, as I said, bring them along to a place where they didn't expect. But we have to think very hard about not only what stories we're telling, but how we're telling them and what the tone is which they're telling them, which is maybe sort of an answer to your question. Can we get to the hand in the front here? Hi, thank you. Thank you. Yes, I would like to ask a question. I'm a fellow at the Reuters Institute here. I would like to ask a question about the digital subscriptions you introduced, I think, last year. Um, I'm curious, I mean, uh, what are uh, Vanity Fair readers uh, finding more uh, most useful about the subscription, and how has it changed the priorities and the processes of your newsroom? Thank you. So the question is about our um, subscriber model, which the the um, nuts and bolts of which are if you read four stories on our site in a month, um, you will then be asked to subscribe in order to have access to the fifth and following. Um, and yes, we introduced it about a year ago, <coughs> and it has been very successful. And I have a number of thoughts about this. One of them is that I think back to what I was saying about um, this thing about long form. Um, around the same period, people were very convinced that everything on the internet was going to be free and that so-called paywalls would not work. And various publications tried them with varying degrees of success, um, but usually they kind of petered out. Something has changed in the ecosystem in the last maybe three, four, or five years. And I think, it's not scientific, but I, I have a sense that it's, there are two things at play. One is that our whole media landscape has kind of um, diversified. And it has become more normal to make, call them micropayments or monthly payments for, broadly speaking, content that we value. So I'm not even talking about publications here. I'm talking about Netflix, HBO Go, Hulu. People began to think, well, you know, it's worth it to me to pay for Netflix Monthly because everybody is watching The Crown. And if I can't watch The Crown, I can't talk to my friends or Game of Thrones, which is something that is currently uh, driving a lot of traffic on our site. Um, and, and where, you know, once upon a time, people were simply, in the States at least, paying an enormous cable bill, they began to drop cable entirely and move toward these things where, well, I'm just gonna pay for this one thing that I like which I think started to instill habits in people that they would do that, that they would pay in, in a, for you know, service from a provider if they felt like the content was unique. Um, so that's one thing. I think that we benefit 
from that. And, and there are other publications at Condé Nast that have um, similar subscription plans, and the New York Times famously is doing very well with theirs. So there's something in the ether about that. The other thing that I think happened is more broadly about, our, um, about the space of journalism, and it is that, um, you know, thanks to our very divisive politics, uh, the, the relation between readers and the media has become very vexed, let's just say. And people who want to be well informed now, I think, understand that being well informed um, has value and it is probably worth paying for. And the truth is that information that's free is often of less value. Um, when I was a freelance editor many years ago, which is to say I'd worked at some magazines and then I was sort of going out on my own and, and so I would, I would edit books individually or um, I'd work at other publications and stuff. I remember I asked a colleague of mine what I should charge, what my rate should be. And I suggested a number and she said, no, set it higher because then people will think you're worth it. And I, I do think, I mean, I've never forgotten it. It was good advice and it did work. And I was worth it, let me say, no. Um, I mean, but you have to, you know, you, you, if you're going to sell yourself as a contract employee, you have to feel that way. It was good advice. And I, I think that in a macro level, that is the logic behind um, charging for your work, which is to say that what we do has value. Um, and in very few other lines of work would that be questioned. So I'm glad that, that our... I'm glad that our work is resonating, and I'm glad that people are paying for it. You know, we are in a moment where traditional revenue streams for publications aren't as reliable as they used to be, and so it's to our advantage to think about other ways um, to make sure that we can sustain the quality of our work, and that's one of them. Can we go to the hand in the third row, please? Alice? Yeah. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm a master's of publishing student and I just wanted to know what you believe makes a magazine credible and what a credible magazine would mean in a world of media, say, today. Well, there's a very simple answer and that's fact-checking. That's, that's like the two-word answer. But I think it's also, it has to do with a larger question of integrity, right? Um, for me at least, and a feeling that there are people at the magazine who are making informed choices that kind of align with the values of their readers. Now, it's easy to say that. Obviously, we circulate at, I don't know, 1.2, 1.3 million. We have tons of millions of fo followers on social media. It's impossible to say that all of our readers share the same set of values. Um, and I would never say that. However, you know, they do have the common denominator of finding value in Vanity Fair. So I think that what we do is work to uphold a certain integrity in terms of the stories that we tell, in terms of our methods of reporting, um, in terms of our um, adherence to legal standards of publication which can be tricky because in the, in the world of the internet, we effectively publish globally. Um, and of course, libel laws and other kinds of laws pertaining to publications are different from country to country. Um, but we stay informed about those things. We have many layers of editing. We have layers of fact checking. And I think that one important thing about the world we live in today is that it's to a publication's benefit to be transparent about those things. I think that there was a day when the readership of publications such as ours assumed that that was the case. But now, because there is so much information and misinformation flooding the zone, it is helpful for us to do what I'm doing right now and remind people that those are our processes and not be afraid to be straightforward about um, what it takes to get a piece from an idea into publication and how we comport ourselves on a photography set um, and what our correspondence is like with our readers and all of that. I think transparency is a huge benefit in terms of 
making sure that people understand the authenticity and the integrity of a publication. Thanks. Um, so I have another question about the economics of the industry. So I'm now two years out from college and a lot of my friends are working in the media. And amongst those who are succeeding, I'm seeing in having a career at all, I'm seeing two trends, one of which is young people taking on sort of strings of internships and fellowships that tend to be low paid and short term and often involve a lot of grunt work, clickbait, right. social media. And the other of which is friends of mine who are trying to make their way as freelance writers um, and many of whom are writing really wonderful deep stories but who are living paycheck to paycheck and right. without health insurance and as much as they might try to assert what they're worth, there are many magazines that pay very little, if at all, right. for freelance labor. Um, and I think like one, one of the saddest consequences of this is that it, it, it often seems like this career is, is only accessible to people who can have some kind of fallback yeah. um, given these financial conditions. So I'm just curious what, what you as an editor think that you could do or that the industry could do to, to make it better for young people. It's a good, it's a, it's a good question and a big problem. Um, and I think about my own experience and the jobs that I could not have taken, the internships I could not have taken, um, and were the times when I felt that I needed to make different strategic decisions in order to have a paycheck or have health insurance and all of those things. Um, you know, th there are sort of various rungs of coping with it. One of them is to forego the whole idea of an unpaid internship or, um, or any wage that is that is not a living wage, um, and to pay overtime and to you know be responsible in those ways, um, and to be timely with payment. And these are all granular things, but they're probably the kinds of things that your friends are are coping with. Um, and you know, beyond that, it's it's almost like the health of the industry is the thing that is going to get us over those humps. And it's hard to say exactly what, you know, where that will go. I mean, it, there are, as you've probably seen, you know, there, are, there have been a lot of reasons for optimism and hope in terms of new digital only publications and investments in those publications and what have you. And then there can be a little bit of a bubble and suddenly those publications aren't doing as well as we thought. And so I, I was saying this earlier, I mean, I think the truth is that to be in this business, uh, money aside, you have to have a tolerance for uncertainty and instability, and which is you know not for everyone. Um, and and I, do, I don't have a solution for that because it's a little bit beyond our control, right? Um, but I do think that ultimately, you know, ultimately if people are chased out of the profession who would otherwise enrich it, it's, I mean, it's something that we have to solve. And I, I can't think of how to do it except, again, to kind of be as wide-ranging as we can be in terms of who we hire and as responsible as we can be in terms of what we pay um, and, and how we do that. And, you know, and I think it's important for the health of the field that it be as diverse as it can be. So it's not, it's more an acknowledgement of your, of the problem than, <laughs> than a solution, but it is something, it is something that we, th that we think a lot about. Thank you, Radhika, for that. Uh, it seems that in many ways, Vanity Fair is a cultural institution of itself, unlike lots of other pub publications. There's certainly no New Yorker post-Oscars party. Um, and I guess my question is, how do you balance proximity to power and powerful individuals with the obligation that you have as a journalist or as a magazine to speak truth to that power and challenge it? It's a good question. It, 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 I think I made a decision when I took the job that I, um, that I would always be willing to take the side of the story. That, that's the best way I can think of, of, of putting it. Um, you know, th th 
it is a danger when you become an editor or even as a journalist that you can kind of cross over um, with your subjects, individual subjects, kind of, you know, whole fields of subjects. And it's true that we celebrate Hollywood as much as we cover it. It's a, it's a, it's a little tension at the heart of the enterprise. Um, but, you know, I came up through newsrooms. And so at the end of the day, I, f I feel pretty comfortable saying what has to be said in the story. And I also feel, honestly, that most people of integrity understand that that is the journalist's role. And again, I think that we're living in an environment when, and I'm not talking about printing gossip, you know, or kind of gotcha things. I'm talking really, truly about truth. I think we live in an environment where those things are valuable. And, you know, we journalists are human and we do want to get it right. And if someone feels that they've been treated unfairly or that they haven't been um, given an opportunity to respond or what have you, you know, we, it's absolutely our job to hear them out. And it's our job to correct things if we've gotten them wrong. And, and we have the capacity to do that. But I, having worked for so long in newsrooms, I, th I think I have a pretty thick skin about it, and that is helpful. Can we go to the hand in the back? Looking back, what do you have to say about Graydon Carter's time at Vanity Fair? And having taken the reins, what do you think you've had to focus on and improve to take it forward? So when I was offered the job, um, I, uh, well, first I panicked, as, as you do. Um, and then I requested bound volumes of the magazine from all of its chapters. So there were, there were vanity fairs from the 1910s and kind of the jazz age. Um, and at that point, it looked more like the New Yorker. It's like illustrated covers and, um, and little bits and bobs of a sort of sophisticated life. And then from the 80s, when Tina Brown was the editor um, and, and created some of those iconic moments, if you know anything about Vanity Fair, maybe you know the, the cover of Demi Moore, um, Naked and Pregnant, um, which really was the first time that a woman had been shown in that way and endures as a point of conversation about how women and how pregnancy are seen in the public space. And so, and Tina was a big risk taker. And, and so I looked at her, the magazine early in her tenure because I was, of course, most interested in beginnings. I don't know what the end will hold, but I was interested in editor's beginnings. And I looked at Graydon's. And, and it, he, had, he, now I've had more of a chance to consider and certainly poking through the archive, I've seen it. Uh, there, there is a through line there that's very strong that has to do with personality and power and aspiration. And those things are subjective. They change with the times from the outside. They change from the editor-in-chief's point of view. Um, one thing, I mean, Graydon was an absolute master at stories of power. He also championed war photography. Um, there was a lot of muscular journalism in the magazine, as there was under Tina. And he found a balance between the kind of glitz and glamour of Hollywood and the, you know, literally scenes from war which I thought was incredibly bracing and which I wanted to emulate. Um, I think in a way that the thing that began to strike me was that, as you would expect, we had different points of view about nostalgia. Um, and nostalgia was something, it wasn't really in Tina's magazine. Tina's magazine was very um, of the moment. And Graydon, from looking at his work, he began to introduce these sort of top notes of nostalgia that kind of harked back to the um, the glory days of Hollywood, say the 30s, the 40s, you know, there, there was like, he, he reported, they reported a lot on the Kennedys, um, on Grace Kelly. There were these kind of icons of um, glamour that his Vanity Fair seemed to gravitate to. Now, he and I are of different generations. So naturally, my nostalgia is just torqued in a different way. And what I think is, it's, it's more recent basically. And what I found interesting is that there is something going on in the culture at large um, in that regard as well, because 
I first began to notice it when the documentaries and the, the limited series about O.J. Simpson came out, about the O.J. Simpson trial, which I had watched in real time in the 90s when it was, you know, there was, it was broadcast every day. Uh, I was living abroad, and it, weirdly, it was my connection to America. I mean, it was very um, problematic. But, um, but, you know, everyone was riveted by it. And I remember when those documentaries were announced a few years ago, and I thought, very stupidly, I thought, well, who would want to watch that? What a sordid and terrible, tragic chapter of American life. And of course, everybody watched it. A, it was really well done. B, there's whole generations younger than me who didn't watch that trial live, didn't know the story. It does tell us a lot about race and class and violence in America and who suffers and who doesn't. And it, it, that, the way that those those documentaries and series were done, you could trace a line from that moment to the present. And that's when nostalgia is interesting. I mean, it's not just a look back, right? It's the idea is that it kind of frames and interprets the present. So, so I would say that one of the changes that I've noticed, which I wasn't even necessarily, I hadn't even articulated it until I began to take in everything um, that came before me, is that I think I'm more interested in this recent past. I think it can be a blind spot. Um, I think that when you, you know, when you reach an older age, you, you just, you do, you forget that not everyone has that shared experience. And so it's another reason why it's helpful to have a diverse newsroom, not just in terms of where people are from or, or you know, but literally in terms of their age. Um, what do they know? What is common knowledge to someone who's 20 years younger than you versus common knowledge to someone 20 years older? And so, that's something I've thought a lot about. And I think it's, it's interesting, even just on a meta level, in terms of a transfer of leadership, when you change that perspective. Um, we're seeing a lot of fights now in American politics you know, between the baby boomers and the millennials. And they're generational. But there's something there that's important. Um, my generation, which is Gen X, is always left out of these conversations, I should say, which is very classic Gen X. But you know, there it is. <laughs> We have time for one more question. Um, if we could go to the hand over there. Uh, hi, I also have a sort of an economics question, but perhaps on the expenses side. So, um, because like I don't have an intuition about this. So how much, in terms of resources, does it take to produce one of your stories? Um, what are some of the hidden sort of problems and challenges to producing the kind of reporting that you do? Um, it varies very widely, as you would imagine. Um, and it's one of the things that we try to assess at the, at the outset when we're talking about an idea, which is, um, you know, you ask a whole bunch of questions. Who do we have who can be definitive on this topic? Who is going to bring some expertise to it? Where does that person have to travel to? Um, what, if any, are the risks to that person's life, reputation, well-being? You know, all of these things depends on the story. Um, usually going to LA is not dangerous, but you know, we do send people to other places. Um, you know, if we're going to present it in the magazine, there needs to be a certain level of, of photography or illustration. Who is the right, again, and then you have the whole same roster of questions. Who's the right person to capture those images? How, you know, we just, I, I'm, um, I don't want to talk about things that are in the pipeline, but they are on my mind. You know, we sent someone to report a piece in Australia. Um, uh, and, uh, and we did it because we felt that that person was going to come back with something unique, which has happened, and hopefully you will read that in the next few months. Um, so it really is just a trade-off. It's like, it, it, can be very, it can be very inexpensive because there are some pieces that just call on a writer's, you know, kind of their uh, call on experience that they already have. They can be stories that are local. The reporting is mostly phone calls. It's a taxi ride. It's a subway. It's right, you know, like, and that can be a great story. It doesn't correlate, right? Um, but we have to think about it because we have a bottom line. So we are looking for, I guess, what you would call return on investment um, when we go big on a story that is going to be costly. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for today, but please join me in thanking Radhika Jones. <laughs>